Thank you very much, and um, thank you for that introduction and um, the very kind, kind um, welcome that I've had in uh, in Graz. Uh, this is my second visit. I was here just before Christmas um, because I'm uh, teaching a, um, a seminar here, and I've really enjoyed um, finding out more about the centre and, um, <coughs> excuse me, also talking to some of the students and um, having really interesting discussions about what's going on here um, in digital humanities, both here at Graz and in the wider context of Daria, Austria, and um, some of the uh, affiliated national and international projects. So um, I think uh, what's happening here is really interesting from a perspective of um, a critical framework for digital humanities in Austria and um, a good basis for uh, looking at some of the challenges ahead. So. What I want to do um, in this talk is uh, discuss some of the ways that digital humanities, um, as we understand it, is evolving and um, developing, and um, look at some of the current uh, priorities in the field and some of the, um, the new opportunities um, that digital humanities offers us across the humanities disciplines. Um, so. Digital humanities is currently attracting a lot of attention as a transformative intervention in the research life cycle across the humanities. Um, but nonetheless, despite a lot of investment in projects and centres, um, developing a collective infrastructure uh, that takes this research forward um, and enables it to really flourish. Oh my goodness, the pizza's arrived. Uh, <laughs> wildly exciting. Um, <clears throat> best talk ever. Um, so, uh, to look at kind of some of the conditions that we need um, to help digital humanities to flourish and um, identify some of the challenges. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to look at some of my own experience, draw on some of my own experience in the actual practice of digital humanities, and um, use that as a kind of um, framework um, for um, the basis of a slight of a better understanding of some of these future developments and opportunities, um, including, um, which I think is absolutely key, uh, better alignment and collaboration with cultural heritage organisations, and um, hopefully explore some of these emerging research questions uh, that still to need to be addressed in digital humanities, uh, some of which may be taken forward um, here in Graz or with your uh, with your partners elsewhere um, internationally. So um, in news that will be surprising to absolutely none of you, uh, digital humanities is really trendy right now. It's, it's quite hot at the moment. Um, and in the 15 years since the publication of the Blackwell's Companion to the Digital Humanities, um, which first coined that term, Digital Humanities, there's been a real proliferation of projects, centres, conferences, associations, journals, and books. And we even have, as you see on the left there, a manifesto for digital humanities, which I think is wildly exciting. Um, I think every, every academic discipline deserves a manifesto. Um, so the rapid growth of the field and the idea that research generated by the use of digital content methods and tools can uh, provide new intellectual perspectives on the nature of the digital as well as the nature of the humanities has led to quite a lot of assumptions in the media and the popular press as well as in the academy um, with some commentators uh, making wild claims for digital humanities. I've seen claims that the digital humanities will eventually just become the humanities and disappear completely as a separate field. Um, it's also claimed that it's where all the jobs are and it's where all the funding is. And I have to say that the claims for it being where all the funding is are usually for people who haven't received any funding. Um, 
But I think one of the reasons that digital uh, digital humanities attracts a lot of attention is that it's become what Matt Kirschenbaum at the University of Maryland has called a free-floating signifier, um, a label for self-identification. We all use digital data for research by default. Um, at the very least, we all use electronic catalogues that point to analog resources. And scholars rely now on a very steady consumption of digital source materials for both scholarship and pedagogy, um, mostly created through large-scale digitization initiatives, um, which have, been, have taken place in universities, libraries, museums, and archives, and uh, especially noteworthy by commercial entities. And we don't just use data. Um, many scholars now create and manage these resources, um, and even if that's just publishing our research in institutional repositories, um, we are still we still use the digital life cycle as part of our research. We also um, communicate uh, digitally, um, often via blogs or Twitter, and we use a lot of digital dissemination methods for both sharing and challenging our research results. And for many of us, um, especially those of us who are slightly older than some of the students in the room, um, this really represents a sea change in practice um, within the very recognizable lifespan of an academic career. And now, if you, um, there are almost as many definitions of digital humanities as there are digital humanities centers now. Um, but if I was going to hazard a, get a, a definition of what I see as digital humanities, um, I'd use it as a, I, I'd, I'd hazard um, a combination, that it's a combination of using digital content um, with digital methods for the analysis and interpretation of this content and applying tools for specific uh, scholarly tasks and then communicating this research to the widest possible audience using both traditional and non-traditional publishing methods. So the benefits of this, um, these approaches are twofold. Um, digital humanities approaches um, both facilitate and enhance existing research. Um, they make um, traditional um, and existing research processes much easier, um, faster, more effective, more efficient, reaching a wider audience. Um, than the use of, um, uh, via the use of computational tools and methods. And secondly, um, they, and I think more interestingly, they enable research that would be impossible to undertake without digital resources and methods. And this is what enables us to ask new research questions, um, the sort of research questions that are driven by insights that are really only achievable um, through the use of these new tools and methods. And I think fundamentally, all of these approaches, uh, approaches rely on collaboration. Um, we collaborate with researchers from scientific disciplines, um, as well as from other humanities disciplines. Uh, we work very closely with the computational and technical fields. And we also work very, very closely with cultural heritage organizations. And um, this sort of research, uh, that um, this approach for digital humanities as a, as a kind of categorization, also relies on underlying technical infrastructures. Um, but the other, uh, the other um, sort of collaboration group and another important um, group of stakeholders is, of course, the audience um, for the work that we produce and user-led design and participation through mechanisms like crowdsourcing has involved the development of a lot of digital humanities initiatives. Now, um, I very much like this characterization of digital humanities as being about content, tools, and methods, um, because it creates a working environment that presupposes a working environment with raw materials, content, tools for working with the raw materials, and expertise in digital methods and it's also a bit of a hat tip to the positivist, objectifying, task-oriented and practical approach um, that's been described by Gary Hall. And this is something that's spilled into a debate in digital humanities that set the makers or coders 
against the theorists, which I think is a bit unfortunate. Um, people like Alan Liu and others have explored digital humanities as a means of cultural critique. And I would argue that this maker and theorist perspectives are, are not at all incompatible. In fact, it's through developing and building digital humanities projects through practice that we can really conduct the cultural and critical analysis, questioning a lot of the assumptions on which digital resources are built and communicated and developing a better framework for understanding the ways that working with digital knowledge and digital infrastructure is transforming our um, consumption and production of knowledge. Um, I also used to work in Wales at the National Library of Wales, um, so I'm highly motivated to get coal mining into as many of my slides as possible, <laughs> so hence the, um, the utilitarian positivist uh, coal mining approach to digital humanities. So, um, developing a deeper understanding um, of the digital resources that we rely on is a pretty good place to start to build this, um, this conceptualization through practice um, as a basis for um, critical analysis. Um, a lot of what we classify as digital humanities is actually consumption. Um, it's scholarly use of digital resources and foreign digital material. Uh, working in what Roy Rosenweig, um, who was at the Center for New Media um, at um, George Mason University, um, has called a culture called a culture of abundance. And um, while this presents new possibilities, it also creates um, significant challenges. Um, Tim Hitchcock at the University of Sussex um, wrote uh, an article called, um, Confront, it's a wonderful title, Confronting the Digital, or How Academic History Writing Lost the Plot, um, in which he talks about how researchers work with data um, and rely on data, which is what we would very charitably call limited in its potential for reuse, thanks to problems with optical character recognition, uh, markup and description and provenance information. People put up with far more limitations <coughs> in digital data than they would tolerate in analog data um, because of the ease of access and the, um, the, the, the volume of data available. Um, similarly, a lot of the limitations with metadata um, often mean that the only way to really engage with digital archives is through keyword searching, um, which gives us a quick hit in terms of a result, but misses very important contextual information that enables really mindful engagement with archival content, and there's some research to show that that mindfulness and thoughtfulness um, of engagement with the original sources is lacking in the digital. Um, questions of scale of the original sources, their condition and their context is very often hidden when we work with digital surrogates, um, which can appear, especially if we're searching at, if we reach them through a search engine, they appear as disembodied objects. Um, Ryan Cornell, uh, Cordell sorry, at uh, Northeastern University theorized, has theorized a network author function in antebellum newspapers um, from his work on viral text, working with digital newspaper archives, has said that most digital archives hide more than they reveal, um, as keyword searches require prior knowledge of the text to be discovered, and can lead to evidentiary excess. Um, that's in his article, Reprinting Circulation of the Network Author and Develop Newspapers in American Literary History. Another big issue is the selection of content for digitization. Uh, due to limitations of funding, availability of analog sources, as well as copyright and licensing issues, many digital archives are not complete. Um, the example that you see up here is the Welsh Newspapers Online uh, resource, um, where the National Library of Wales received funding from the Welsh Government and uh, the ERDF um, from the European Commission to digitise a million pages of Welsh newspapers from its analogue holdings. Um, they date from 1800 to 1919, and they're in both Welsh and English, about 70% of them are in English. Um, 
Now, as a selection um, of the newspaper coverage of the time, it's a very important resource for research and teaching, but it's really important to remember that it's by no means a full representation of all the newspapers of the period. And um, if you go to the homepage of the resource, you see this very useful chart um, um, clarifying um, the periods, 10-year um, periods, um, within which the materials are digitized. You see most of them come from um, 1890 to 1900. Um, however, um, there's a lot missing from the 1909-1919 period. Um, and this is because a smaller separate funding resource uh, source was used for this. It doesn't reflect the fact that there were less newspapers during this time. Um, but for the user, it's much too easy to just look at this diagram and assume that the resource um, is a complete representation of all Welsh newspapers ever. Um, and this, the chart there only shows the proportion of newspapers in this resource. It doesn't show that as a proportion of newspapers printed during these time periods. So it's actually a very, very misleading chart. Um, this is problematic because as we know, users, especially students, frequently turn to digital content by default um, when looking for historical resources. And because this is a freely accessible resource, um, this newspaper archive is very likely to be used. So as with any other archive, many other archives like this, the fact that it doesn't present a full picture or even explain clearly what it does show is very worrying. Um, another issue for future research and um, something that I'm hoping to do more research into myself um, is the rather urgent need for better analysis and linking of digital content. And despite all we know about digital curation and good practice, digital content is all too frequently locked in digital silos, unable to be openly reused and linked with other content. Um, Evaluation um, of users of digital content, especially academic users, shows that scholars frequently have very simple questions or ideas that they want to test with data at the desktop level. They don't want the technology to be a barrier. And we still haven't managed to fully integrate tools for analysis and linking into a lot of digital <coughs> content. Um, Digital projects need to be much more open sand pits for experimentation. There needs to be a disassociation of text and data from platform and delivery methods, <coughs> linking digital resources for purposes unanticipated by the creators of digital resources. There's still very much an emphasis on creating a website, building a website, and there's not the emphasis on making the, the data more open for repurposing and using. Um, for example, users want to be able to use very, very simple pattern finding tools like Ngram, which you see at the bottom right hand um, there, um, which uh, can be used with um, Ngram type tools, can be used with a range of data, data sets um, to very quickly test hypotheses. Ngram was originally built um, for use with Google Books, um, but um, modifications of Ngram can be adopted for other data sets. Um, this is one that um, was uh, developed at the National Library of Wales, and it's um, an analysis of the term Belgian refugees in the Welsh <coughs> newspapers online from 1914 to 1918. Um, this search, um, a lot of um, Google Book searches um, are limited by terminology and variants. Um, despite the fact, <coughs> excuse me, despite the fact that um, Welsh newspapers online is a corpus of both Welsh and English language newspapers, this search is um, is meaningful, st meaningful statistically because the Welsh for Belgian refugees is Belgian refugees, which helped enormously with doing this, uh, this analysis. Um, and what I think is interesting about this is that it shows a huge spike in references to Belgian refugees in 1914, late 1914, um, during the period of um, hostilities in Belgium, the fall of, um, the fall of Belgium, and a very large migration of um, the Belgian population um, as a consequence, and the willingness of um, the British Isles to take in 
um, a quarter of a million Belgian refugees throughout the course of the First World War. Um, but this spike tails off as the war continued, Belgian refugees in Wales, um, but I've worked with colleagues who've done analysis in other parts of the United Kingdom um, and the British Isles, and um, that spike is mirrored in collections in Ireland, um, in Liverpool and in Scotland, there's a lot of interest which then tailed off um, as the war continued and as the, um, the refugees became um, harder to support and less fashionable um, as things continued. Um, so for, question, for a question like this, um, using Ngram as a very simple tool for this sort of pattern finding is really quite compelling and quite time saving. But the underlying data um, that I worked with on this, um, I'd like to publish and annotate this kind of data digitally, and I'd like to link it to other sources and data about refugees in this period, um, which, is held, which are held in other archives around Europe. I'd like to take this data out of its Welsh silo and link it to related material from archives in London, Belgium, and elsewhere. And I'd also like to integrate this data seamlessly into publications, uh, linking it back to the original data. Um, one of the huge advantages of digital access is that it makes the invisible visible in archives, but we lose this when we can't easily reuse and repurpose this content. We need to make it much more accessible based on constructing a digital commons as a basis for future production. We don't actually know what's going to be made of our con what use is going to be made of our content in the future as new research approaches emerge and new ways of working with content are, are uh, perfected. So in many cases, digital archives have been created by memory organizations. Um, where we've seen a very praxis-driven development of digital heritage content that's driven by access and which is relatively uninformed by the emerging critical and theoretical framework of digital humanities and the emerging research agendas presented by the development of large-scale digital collections. And these issues have convinced me um, that if the digital humanities is going to make effective use and reuse of digital content, it needs to really foreground content, collection building and curation as a process of co-production with galleries, libraries, archives and museums. And an example of this kind of co-production or co-curation can be seen in the development of uh, JISC funded, which is a UK, um, uh, UK funding agency uh, mass digitization project called Cymru1914.org, um, the Welsh experience of the First World War. Um, this integrates open digital sources from a variety of archives with an underlying technical architecture of an open source digital repository, which is extensible we can add more content over time and make this a real living digital archive. Cymru1914.org was a collaboration between the National Library of Wales, partner archives, communities and researchers, uh, bringing together research, curation and archive management to really imagine the creation of a digital resource as less a digitization project than a process of creative making bringing together scholars and curators in ways that really recast the role of each, uh, driven by the shared goal of developing an integrated data archive that's both inclusive in terms of content and community involvement, but which also enables the reassessment of historical sources through its reuse for new purposes by a variety of audiences over time. And this archive also includes um, community-generated content that was brought to digitization workshops um, via targeted crowdsourcing approach. Um, similarly, um, another project that um, I developed, um, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, um, The Snows of Yesteryear, is also a project based on co-creation and interdisciplinarity that really typifies what I think digital humanities looks like now. Um, the project was a collaboration between humanities research, the archives of the National Library of Wales, 
and the ACAR Atmospheric Reconstructions of the Earth project at the Met Office in the UK, which seeks to reconstruct and visualize historic weather for analysis and visualization of climate change over time. So, focusing on Wales, uh, we worked with archives from the pre-weather instrument, the pre-weather instrument period, which is approximately before 1800 um, in the British Isles, um, to find instances of extreme weather events in archives and manuscripts and people's responses to them. So we looked at diaries, letters, ballads, um, and other um, ar archival material. Um, and then we explored um, digitization of these archives um, and made them accessible um, to, for analysis to uncover narratives of extreme weather impacts. So we had lots of frozen, frozen chickens and frozen um, lakes and all sorts of things. Um, we then conducted interviews with people in the area of Wales that we were looking at um, to develop narratives of the impact of extreme weather within living memory. And we compared people's contemporary and um, uh, recent historical um, descriptions um, to what was in the archives. And we came up with a number of very, very common narrative markers for extreme weather. People's language when they're describing these events doesn't change dramatically. Um, the material and the dialogue between the climate researchers and the public and the archivists was then subsequently the inspiration for a public performance piece, um, Ghost Dance, which you see the uh, poster for there, which was created by the performance artist Eddie Ladd, um, which drew on all of these disparate narratives um, as a piece describing the events of the winter of 1963, which was very severe weather, a uh, very severe winter in Wales, lots and lots of snow, an unprecedented amount of snow. But it was also the winter that there was um, a lot of Welsh language nationalist activism, um, and um, the, um, the, the, the two narratives were brought together in this performance piece. And then just for fun, um, we got the climate scientists um, at the Met Office to visualize um, the weather reports um, internationally from 1962-1963. So we've got documentary evidence, narrative evidence, scientific visualizations, and a performance all coming together um, around a specific um, research topic. And I think this is a pretty good exa exemplar to me um, of digital humanities in practice. Um, it's a real experiment in building and sustaining complex hybrid archives of materials related um, to these extreme weather impacts in Wales, um, bringing together their analysis through performance, through scientific visualization, and then working with the communities that contribute the data and have an ownership of the data. And it's a sort of project, it's a digital curation nightmare, um, but it's the sort of project we're going to see more and more of as we move towards um, Humanities 3.0, which isn't just a collection of sources, but it's a real convergence of practices. Uh, we're bringing together artistic, scientific, and humanistic practice and building a real connected community around the content. And documenting this sort of practice and publishing this sort of practice, writing about it in our disciplinary journals and um, peer-reviewed publications, creates all sorts of really interesting and difficult issues. Um, how do we replicate this relationship between the archives, the scientific visualization, and the performance? Um, how is the provenance of archives retained when they're embedded in a scientific visualization or a performance which draws on them. Um, and this collaboration of disciplines and data types is an act of curation as much as a piece of scholarship. And it's a con and how this convergence of digital and born digital um, can be preserved and replicated over time is very much an installation question. It's a, a question for produ production and performance as much <coughs> as archives. Um, this embedding of print and um, analog sources 
within a multiplicity of media practices and forms of knowledge production is also something that's highlighted in the Digital Humanities Manifesto, remember our manifesto, as an exciting means of determining the interface to information, data and knowledge, and situating these as information management challenges associated with managing and sustaining complex collections over time is a major step forward in the stewarding and curation of humanities data, um, which can foster expertise that will be essential to managing born digital material over time. So creating open and innovative research is one thing, this sort of project is very easy to create, um, but communicating it in ways that are recognized by our peers is another. And I think digital humanities has really yet to successfully resolve one of the fundamental issues, which is how we communicate this research and make it accessible to others. Um, digital humanities projects are very often sandpits for experimentation. Um, this sort of project is very much a process of experimentation. And traditional publishing models really aren't effective at, de at communicating um, and de at, at delivering the rich open and extensible publications that we need to com communicate this sort of research and the data and outputs it depends on. And we need much better engagement between digital humanities and publishing to transform and really rock publishing to its core so that it does encompass the variety of content practices and research cultures that digital humanities now incorporates. So, in order to address these challenges, um, public, uh, publication of outputs, better exposure of data for linking and integrating into other content, and developing resources as a process of co-creation, we need to start thinking beyond delivering digital projects or digital resources, but on developing digital research infrastructure approaches. Now, I'm from the UK, um, where I have to say we're very wary of research infrastructure, as we see it um, as, a, as a European concept, um, which um, has taken hold uh, in European digital humanities research far more in the UK. Um, there is a perception among the research councils and senior academics in the humanities in the UK to see research infrastructures as um, no more than scientific um, <coughs> scientific impositions, uh, machines that go ping and big bits of kit. Um, but actually, look, this is just over complicating things. Research infrastructures are far less an alarming <coughs> position from the technocrats and much more an extension of the research library or the museum in the digital age. They bring together the things we need to do good research, which is people, partnerships, content, recognition, networking, outreach, and scholarly communication. And if we look at the European Research Infrastructure Consortium, or ERIC, practical guidelines, they state that the ERIC status, this is the guidelines for research infrastructure, is reserved for state-of-the-art research infrastructures that will create unique opportunities to carry out advanced research, attract the best researchers from across the world, and train highly qualified students and engineers. Until that last word, it would apply directly to the humanities. Um, and it's very easy to map these requirements to the things that we find in our digital humanities coal mine, content, tools, methods, technical infrastructures, communities of practice, both researchers and users, as well as innovative publishing and dissemination routes. It's also the focus for networks of cooperation, both national and international. Um, our research infrastructure in the digital age is therefore a scholarly ecology, one that supports ongoing scholarly development and use of digital resources and the outputs they enable. And as an ecosystem, parts would be interdependent and would hopefully be greater than the sum of their parts. It's a way of thinking about digit developing digital humanities that will both enable it to support traditional research in new and more effective ways, but enable the conceptualization of some important new research questions. And it's easy to see the development of something like Cymru1914.org as the basis of a First World War research infrastructure. It could integrate associated projects, it could expose data, provide a crowdsourcing layer for data and metadata capture, 
provide a publications and teaching layer, and grow the underlying data in ta over time in association with libraries and archives that hold the primary source material. Um, in an initiative like this, there's a clear role for scholars not just to provide input into resource creation, but to contribute to greater scholarly investigation and critique of the whole process of digital source creation. The need for richer, enhanced digital data online is the next phase of open electronic text creation, for example. From the perspective of those creating digital archives and resources, this can also be the basis for a more theoretical reflection concerning knowledge production. Developing maker spaces and data labs as part of these research infrastructures can also be the basis for putting these kind of ideas into practice. And these are the sort of initiatives that we need to be building. And the need for them is why I don't think digital humanities is going to become just what humanities scholars do. There's always going to be a need for the development of cutting edge research that's really going to anticipate what scholars need in the future working in collaboration with the heritage sector, as well as the technical disciplines requ requiring more than the capacity of an individual project or even a department. So a resource that documents how this digital humanities research life cycle can be re represented in a research infrastructure and in fact provide a framework for the creation, enhancement and use of digital cultural heritage has recently been developed under the auspices of uh, ESF Research Network in Digital Humanities, Nedima.eu, um, that I was the chair of until it concluded earlier this year. Um, NEMO, the Nedima Methods Ontology, is an ontology of digital humanities that formally documents the practice of digitally based scholarship as an activity that explicitly addresses the interplay of factors of agency actors and goals, processes, activities and methods, and resources, information resources, content, tools, concepts, and methods in the scholar, throughout the scholarly process. And it shows the dependencies of content, tools, and methods. Um, through, the, uh, through the Europeana Research Initiative, um, researchers at Glasgow University and the DCU at Athena Research Institute in Greece are using it as a conceptual framework to describe the use of Europeana content for research. Um, it can also be used as a tool for semantic linking um, and making clear the dependency of digital resources and services for discovering, understanding, selecting, linking and contributing content tools and methods. So I'm hoping that NEMO will emerge as a formal framework for critique and debate um, about the context and dependencies within the use of digital content for research and facilitate some of that mindfulness and engagement that's required around the use of this material. So it's a, a formal technical framework um, for that critical <coughs> framework. So what are the challenges going forward? Um, in the digital humanities, we use stuff and we build stuff. Uh, my view is that building stuff is the best way to create praxis-based critical engagement that's the key to understanding the ways that the digital has affected and is affecting knowledge production. Um, projects like The Snows of Yesteryear and Cymru 1914.org <coughs> show how digital content creation can be enriched when it's developed collaboratively when we move away from static methods and tools to working in a much more fluid environment of interdisciplinary co-production and working with a variety of formats, not just text, but moving image, audio, animation, making. Um, this has significant implications as we look forward to further digitization of Europe's cultural heritage, especially 20th and 21st century materials, which are complex, multimedia, and frequently held in hybrid collections with born digital content and metadata requiring innovative approaches to delivery, management and use of content um, to represent this multiplicity of digital research questions. So building research infrastructures to support, support these agendas will draw us into new collaborations um, lead us to explore 
um, and encounter new methods for engaging with content and assist in developing new insights into heritage um, and with a number of strategic areas of impact. And the first is developing a better understanding of the use and users of digital content. This is some, still something that we are not very good at in the digital humanities, is understanding what people do with all this digital stuff and developing analysis of the content that enables us to understand users and their information seeking inquiry, you know, behaviors. We should be using this data to target. Um, the second is the development of underlying digital infrastructures and associated services and understanding these services and technologies for complex multilingual multimedia <coughs> contact content um, will have considerable impact on all aspects of not just the creative economy, but sectors that rely on the reliable, trusted delivery of high quality content to users for a <coughs> range of information needs. That's the bit in the grant application that says impact um, to other communities. Um, and the third area where I think we need to see a lot of development is understanding how open content can really be used and repurposed for new and innovative ideas. We want to be able to extract our data and digital content for a variety of new and unforeseen purposes and to be clear of the benefit of those such as linking content. Um, the digital archives contain data, our digital archives contain data that has use for commercial benefit, <coughs> spatial data like place names, linguistic data, economic data could be reused for a variety of purposes including big data approaches to understanding social and economic issues like the movement of population <coughs> over time. So digital archives have a lot of potential community and include, inclusion agendas including um, information literacy and community engagement and the emergence of crowdsourcing approaches to working with archives is generating a huge amount of data about how people engage with content digitally and how verification and provenance of community generated data can be verified. So there's a wide range of challenges and impact agendas that can emerge through the research infrastructure approach to developing digital project, digital humanities projects. And I think that better digital humanities and cultural heritage partnerships will really accelerate these agendas because they can be based on common goals and a shared vision of transformation of research, sustainable scholarship, and access to interpretation of knowledge, which is an excellent way to define digital humanities through practice. Thank you.